We'll talk a little bit about how to begin with the analysis of the data that you collected for your capstone project. I realized that the type of analysis that you'll do depends on the type of data that you collected. Some of you have conducted qualitative interviews with people. Some of you have conducted surveys. Some of you are compiling social media data or other archival data. And so the type of analysis that you do really depends on the type of data that you collect. I'm go Today I'll talk a little bit about maybe analyzing two different types of data. We'll take one example from survey research and then we'll take another example from qualitative research in terms of content analysis. So let's talk let's talk a little bit about the different steps that are involved when you're collecting data and analyzing data. What we've just concluded is the first step in this process which is the called I, what I call a kind of data acquisition and data acquisition is where you're conducting interviews you're collecting surveys you um, maybe you're assembling social media postings or other archi archival information into a document for analysis um, if you if you're if it's transcripts maybe they're in a word format if it's survey data maybe it's in an excel or a csv format okay so once you've acquired the data for your project, the next step is to go through with cleaning and formatting that data, almost kind of preparing it for um, statistical or um, uh, content analysis. So with data cleaning and formatting, this might involve transcribing audio recordings of the interviews. Make sure that the transcripts line up with the audio, audio recordings that you're correctly um, transcribing the uh, the audio into text. Uh, for a survey research this might mean entering um, survey responses from paper surveys into uh, a computer database or, or it might mean um, extracting data from a survey software platform and putting it into a, a format for analysis. Uh, maybe, maybe this involves um, social media postings, uh, filtering them, and uh, maybe defining the analytic sample that you're going to look at. Okay, so say you've um, cleaned and formatted your data. The next step is to familiarize yourself with that data. Um, so what, what I call like data familiarity. This is where you're kind of reading transcripts line by line. If you're doing qualitative research, you just want to get familiar with the type of data that you have. So maybe you read transcripts line by line, or you go through social media postings one by one to just get familiar with what people are talking about, what are some of the issues that people are mentioning. If you have survey research and you have individual survey items, you might begin just by doing frequencies, uh, running, um, looking at the counts uh, for different responses to survey questions, or looking at if you have numerical um, responses, maybe looking at the distribution of those survey responses in hist. Try to use like a visual format like histograms um, or a tabular format like frequency distributions, and then you might you might choose to combine. Um, multiple items into a single index or scale. You might create new variables uh, that become the main focus of your analysis. The last, so the interesting thing about doing um, data analysis is that the the data analysis is often the last step. Um, there's a lot that comes before it, acquiring, cleaning, formatting, and familiarizing yourself with the data. The last step is data analysis. So for qualitative research this might involve open coding, identifying codes and categories from transcripts or social media. Um, for survey research, this might involve examining relationships between study variables through cross tabulations or ANOVA tests or more advanced techniques like regression analysis. This is the final step in analysis and once you've completed the data analysis, you can begin um, writing up your results. So let's talk a little bit about survey analysis. Particular, this is specific to quantitative data. The first step is to compile the survey responses into an analytic file. And what do I mean by an analytic file? This is a, a, a computer file that you can import into a statistics program like SPSS, R, or Stata. Common formats include um, CSV or Excel sometimes um, if the program has flexibility to do that. Basically what you want to do is enter your survey responses into a spreadsheet with one row for each observation or respondent to your survey and one column 
for each survey question. You want to make sure that responses are entered and coded numerically. Uh, for the most part, you want to check for errors. Um, this is the kind of um, quality checking process. Next, you want to import that analytic file into a software program for analysis. Um, there's a lot of different statistical software programs out there. Um, one really easy to use one is SPSS. It's very user friendly. Um, not so user friendly is R. Um, it's, uh, it's the program that I use. Um, the advantage of R is that it's open source. It does have a little bit more of a learning curve. Um, some of the students in our class are using R for their analysis and it's, it's very powerful. It has great um, ways of visualizing data, but it, it does have a little bit of a learning curve. Uh, so some people also use Excel uh, for statistical analysis. You just want to make sure that um, all of the responses were imported and entered correctly. You want to make sure that by, by error that maybe a, a variable isn't missing um, or that the data got imported correctly, that the responses are coded correctly once they're into the statistical program or the software program for analysis. The next step is to just just to um, calculate what are called summary statistics. Uh, so you want to begin analyzing your survey responses by looking at frequencies of responses for categorical questions. Um, so you might want to, the frequencies are basically just counts. How many times did somebody respond a certain way across the different response categories? Um, if you have Likert responses, you might want to see how many people agreed versus strongly agreed or disagreed or strongly disagreed. If you have numerical data, you might want to look at the averages or the, the median um, or mode values for continuous variables, something like income that's coded in a numerical format. You might want to see how it's distributed within your sample. The next step um, is isn't this is one of the last steps once you've cleaned and formatted your data, created new variables, is examining relationships between study variables. So you can use bivariate statistics such as cross tabulations, t-tests, ANOVAs to explore how variables are related to one another. And you, want, you can indicate the level of statistical significance for any of the reported associations. Uh, so you might choose a p-value. One of the um, p-values for determining statistical significance that's commonly used in research studies is 0.05. If you, have a, if you find a p-value in um, uh, bivariate analysis that's less than 0.05, you can um, kind of have confidence uh, with making the claim that it's statistically significant. Um, cross tabulations are where you're looking at bivariate relationships between two categorical variables. Um, t tests are where you have um, you're looking at com you're comparing group means within two categories. ANOVAs are um, used for comparing group means in three or more categories. The last step is to present results in tables or figures. Um, so you want to figure out, once you've done all your analysis, you want to figure out how to present the results in a way that helps the audience understand and interpret the findings and their implications. So think about, think creatively about what is the best way to present these results um, in my capstone paper. Um, could I use, should I present them in tabular format or, or should I have figures, should I have certain graphs to illustrate the findings. This is something that you want to think about and you really want to prepare the tables and figures first and you want to almost write around those tables and figures. The tables and the figures will become the backbone of your results section. A survey data set often looks like this. You'll have a row for each survey respondent and you'll have a column for each survey variable. In this, in this data set there's name, date of birth, gender, race, zip code, and a few response questions that are coded numerically. So this would be in a format that you could import into a stats program. And in terms of how you might want to format tables, this is a, a table from a, a, a sociology journal um, in which it presents uh, frequency counts and pr valid percentages um, across different uh, content mentions. And there's a, there's a a total uh, response at the bottom. So th this, you know, this could be an example of what a what a kind of a formatted table might look at like for a a survey analysis, uh, a set of results from a survey analysis, just in terms of frequencies. And this is this is um, a a table that actually compares to um, groups 
to one another on several variables. So these, these researchers are comparing boys and girls on a set of variables. And they have a p-column on the right-hand side, which uh, denotes the p-value that compares um, boys to girls on each of the variables that are in the individual rows. So if you're com making comparisons um, between groups, this could be a way to format your table accordingly. This is another example of presenting summary statistics on a set of variables. You might present means, standard deviations, minimum or maximum values. Again, this is a great way to sort of present results uh, from quantitative uh, survey research and analysis. Another example comparing um, different countries on categories. Maybe, maybe think about you might want if you might want to if there are groups within your survey sample that you might want to break out and present characteristics separately for. This is one way in which you could do that. If you want to, this is a, a graph, a very simple graph uh, from a, a paper that I wrote. And maybe, maybe a visual uh, representation of your data could work as a way of conveying your research findings. This is just a, a simple pie graph that shows the, the percentages for different categories um, of a total whole. Okay, now I'm going to briefly talk about what do you do when you have qualitative data. One of the common techniques for doing qualitative data analysis is called content analysis. In content analysis, uh, there are some of the um, these are some of the different steps involved in doing content analysis. Again, the place you, the place you want to start, um, what, regardless of what type of data it is, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, the, the starting point is always familiarizing yourself with the data. Just begin by reading and reviewing your transcripts um, or your other qualitative data source line by line. Um, this could be text from social media posts or transcripts from qualitative interviews. Um, it could be elements from photos, videos, or stories. You just want to become more familiar with the content. This is the process of familiarization. And this is such an important process in, um, in qualitative uh, data analysis, is familiarizing yourself with the data. You want to know your data like the back of your hand. You want to be very familiar with the content. So this is always the place to start. Once you've familiarized yourself with the data, the next uh, step that you can take is to code the text. Um, and what this means is you read um, the text or the transcripts line by line, and you start to make little notes about concept occurrences that are being raised by people. And you might begin to apply what are called codes. And the codes are just labels that are applied to the data by the researcher to represent what are called meaning units. Uh, codes are just tools to think with or heuristic devices. Um, they can be assigned to objects, events, or other phenomena. I recently coded um, Facebook comments that were made in regards to addiction, specifically addiction to opioids like heroin. And when people talked about addiction, they talked about issues like disease or treatment. Um, they talked about whether it was somebody's choice uh, to become addicted. Um, so, the, so we made codes to represent some of the different meaning units that people were talking about. So read through your text and see if you could think about some, what some of the codes are, the different meaning units um, that are are being represented in um, the text that you're analyzing. Once you've developed a set of codes from your text or transcripts, the next step is to kind of group them together, potentially create categories. As you begin coding, you might realize that certain codes can be grouped together into common categories of meaning. Categories really should be mutually exclusive. They should be non-overlapping. However, and they should also share some underlying commonality. A category, you can almost think of a category as a thread that weaves between various codes, with the end result being a code book that has descriptions of all of the codes and categories that apply to your set of data, whether it's social media text or transcripts or other sort of qualitative data.
the last step in content analysis, but perhaps the most um, brainy and difficult, is the analysis um, where you're identifying themes. Um, once you've created a codebook for your data with a set of corresponding codes and categories, the next step is to identify themes from the data. You can think about a theme as a recurring regularity or thread of meaning that recurs throughout the com throughout the comments. Um, so this could be text or transcripts. A theme answers the question how. Um, themes can be a thread of an underlying meaning or an expression of the latent context content of the text. Latent means um, unobserved. And so since all of the data have multiple meanings, themes are not necessarily mutually exclusive. A condensed meaning unit, a code, or a category can fit into more than one theme. A theme can be divided into sub-themes. So you want to think about what are kind of the um, relationships among the codes and categories. How do they apply to one another? What are some of the larger issues or recurring uh, regularities that are represented within your data? This is a, a table from one of my papers. Um, so the way, so even qualitative uh, data analysis, you can have uh, tables and figures. Um, this is a table from, this is what I call a theme table from a qualitative data analysis, uh, from specifically a content analysis. And these are some themes that I observed from in-depth interviews that I conducted with home health aides about uh, a health coach training program that they completed. And the, in the bold text are the theme titles, and then below them are illustrative quotes. So once you identify a set of themes, you might want to pick a few illustrative quotes from the transcripts or the social media data that kind of el elucidate or illustrate the theme in a really clear way. Um, this, so this, is, again, the creating theme tables is a great way to present the results of a content analysis, and you can see this in some of the example capstone papers that are on our course website. I do want to provide you with a few additional resources for conducting survey um, data analysis and content analysis. Please, um, you know, you can, there's a lot of information that's available online about the different steps and procedures in both survey data analysis and content analysis. Feel free to explore these different research um, resources and, and read about different approaches. Um, you, you can kind of think about what the best approach for your specific data is.